Good morning. During the month of July, we're going to be focusing on and around Psalm 51 in a series that we're calling Have Mercy. So today we'll, we'll start very briefly in Psalm 51 and then we will spend the majority of our time on page 262 in the Chair Bible. Uh, that's 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And our subject today is the need for mercy. I want to make you aware of a book. Unfortunately, we sold a whole bunch more of these than we ever anticipated we would. Sorry this happens to 11 o'clock service. But as we're working through Psalm 51 in the month of July, we're encouraging folks to read this book. Is it possible y'all could like zone in with the camera there so people could see this up there? Because we don't have any more. And if I give you mine, all my notes will be gone. And uh, I'm not going to do that. So I'll try to hold that still. This is called The Enemy Within by Chris Lungard. So you can either wait till next Sunday. You can go by out at the Connect area and say, I want one. They'll order you one and we'll have it next Sunday. Or you could just go on to Amazon and order your own. Uh, It's The Enemy Within. The subtitle of the book is Straight Talk About the Power and Defeat of Sin. So how do we as Christians deal with sin in our lives as we continue to seek to follow the Lord. This book, extremely helpful. It has questions in the back, so it's designed to either read by yourself, uh, read with someone else. A husband and wife came up to me afterward. They're going to read it together. Uh, Great plan, great idea as, as to do it. Read it with another man if you're a man, or read it with another woman if you're a woman. We're encouraging growth groups to use it during the month of July to read together and answer the questions. You'll find it extremely helpful and speaking to the issue as to what we're dealing with. Now, we're going to deal with this much of Psalm 51. To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Now, here's what's great. That's all recorded in the Bible. That little simple introduction is in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. And what I'm going to do is to walk you through the narrative step by step today instead of reading it in one swoop. Let me pray for us and we'll get started. Father, thank you that you have called us together today to worship you. Thank you for your holy word. Thank you that it is true. Thank you that it reveals who we are. And as uncomfortable as it may be today to have our hearts exposed, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bring to light to our own self, that we would see the depth of our depravity, the depth of our need, that you would bring us to repentance, that you would do the work of restoration, and you would restore us. We pray that today and over the next several weeks, in Jesus' name, amen. So here's the main idea of what I'm after today. That the Lord graciously rebukes his people when they progress into the displeasing deceitfulness of sin. Now this needs to be in your mind as we start 2 Samuel, particularly if you're not very familiar with the Bible. David is chosen by God to be the king over Israel. One of his first experiences is the defeat of Goliath as a young man. He then enters into a very difficult relationship with the the current king, Saul, who wants to kill him. David continues to pursue the Lord and do the right thing. He ends up being the king. God even refers to David as a man after his own heart. God doesn't allow some incredible things to happen through the leadership of King David. So if you know the story, you'll understand my question. If not, just receive my questions. With knowing those things, that David is a man after God's own heart, how does 2 Samuel 11 and 12 happen? Why does this happen? Can this happen to me? You hear me, I'm going to answer the question. Yes, it can. And if if you don't get that answer to this question, you're missing the intent of how the Bible's written here today. Can this happen to me? Yes, it can. Next question. How do I avoid this happening to me? 
That's our pursuit over the next several weeks. So let's start in verse 1. And we're going to see in chapter 11 how David descends into the displeasing deceitfulness of sin. The first thing we're told is that David remains in Jerusalem. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now the writer is making sure that you understand that David ought to have been, along with the other kings, and Joab, his military leader, and his faithful servants, and all the able-bodied of Israel, he should be out to war. But instead, he remains in Jerusalem. Now why is he there? I don't know. The Bible doesn't answer it. But let me just peer into a man's heart for a minute and answer, I think, three possible reasons he could have remained. Number one, he's lazy. If a man can get out of something, he will. It could have just been idleness. It may be he's just not thinking. It's probably avoidance. He's probably trying to avoid what he needs to do. Regardless, just a simple disobedience. And that's how a downward descent starts, brothers and sisters. A downward descent into the deceitfulness of sin begins with simple disobedience, knowing that you ought to do something and you don't. Now before I leave this point that David's in Jerusalem and he ought not to be, let me pursue addressing young men for a moment. I'm primarily thinking in my mind, young men between the ages of 13 and 30, I'm not trying to belittle you if that's who you are. But let me just address a couple of things to you and make an appeal. The two greatest struggles in your life as a young man and as a man, period, the two greatest struggles you're going to face and continue to deal with is laziness and sexual temptation. You say, well, that's overstating. No, it's not. The Bible wrote you an entire book for it. It's called Proverbs. And Proverbs is over and over dealing with the laziness of a man's heart and the sexual temptation that a man faces. These are the two battles of a man. They continue on and on, but they are at their height when you are in that age of 13 to 30. So what do you need to do if you're in that age? You either, well, first, you need to walk with Jesus. That's number one. Now, when the time gets there, and it's sooner than you think for some of you, you need to get a job. Well, I'm focusing on study. Listen to me. We've hired young men that all they know how to do is do school. That's not enough. A man was designed to work. And he needs to learn to overcome his laziness. And parents, you hear me. Your boys... Are going to get, they'll lay on the couch as long as you let them. They need to get a job. Number three, in this order, get a wife. Walk with Jesus, get a job, get a wife. Now, as long as we continue to allow young men to indulge their flesh, they will. As long as we continue to allow men, and men, as long as we continue to allow ourselves to indulge the flesh, we will. Now hear me. Pornography is a double whammy. Number one, a man becomes a lazy hunk of jello because all he does is sit in front of a computer or on his phone looking at pornography. Then he's divulging into his sexual sin, which, by the way, married men, pornography is adultery. It's not it might be, it is. Ladies, is it adultery? They feel just as violated with you as if you had a real woman. They don't come in my office and say, well, it's not really adultery. You, I just told you what I'm going to say. Yes, it is. 
This just keeps descending into the deceitfulness of sin. Now, young women are giving themselves to pornography. We're all becoming jello. So, what do we need to do? We need to recognize our propensity toward laziness and sexual sin, and we need to avoid those things. And we need to encourage our young people to get a job and get married. Ladies, there's a country song. Take me down to the little white church. The implication of that song is, "Uh uh-uh, buddy, not till we're married. Can I just say it bluntly? Young men aren't motivated to get married. They don't have to anymore. We've made a mess. And we must deal with these things. And as Christ followers, we need to walk with Jesus, get a job, and get married. You say, well, I've got the gift of singleness. Okay, that's for the purpose of the gospel. The reason you're single is for the gospel. Then give your whole self to the gospel. And we can discuss that later. I'll move on now. You say, this is the first verse. That took forever. Just chill out. (laughs) We're going to be fine. So I think verse 1 would read this way. In the, if it was 2019, in the spring of the year when kings go out to battle, David was on his computer. <laughs> now why? Because of this, because of David's mistake here, he descends into breaking three commandments. He covets his neighbor's wife, he commits adultery, and this stuns me, he commits murder. David gives into his flesh. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? In other words, David, this woman's married. I just want to say to you, for people who have heard Bathsheba out to do something wrong, there is no evidence in this text that Bathsheba is doing anything wrong. She's taking a bath. David does wrong. Watch this. He sent messengers and, the Bible uses an emphatic word, he took her. That word means he took something that was not his. He took someone else's possession. And I believe it's also a double entente in in the writer here because this is the exact word it would say that a man took a wife. This isn't his wife. This is Uriah the Hittite's wife. He took her, she came to him, and he lay with her. Will you say, well, she complied. Okay, who is this man? Who is he? You think she had a choice? He took her. Recently, over the course of the last year, there have been a lot of evidence of pastors who have abused their office to take advantage of women. And I I dare say this is going to happen, and you're welcome to come talk with me and I'll try to help you. I had two people share stories with me after the last service based off this illustration. You should tremble before God when you abuse your office. When you abuse your relationship with some child or young person, God have mercy. So he takes her, she becomes pregnant because the Bible says she was purified herself. She wasn't pregnant, she becomes pregnant. Those of you who are parents in the room that are panicking, I'm going to be very diplomatic in my language, but your kids need to hear this sermon. They live in the 21st century. Now David progresses to murder and deceit. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked Joab how how Joab was doing and the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Wash your feet is a euphemism. It means go to bed. Implication is go to bed with your wife. And Uriah went out to the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. So this present saying, your favored 
go home, enjoy yourself. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you come, not come from a journey? Why, Joab and the servants, why, why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah would dwell in Booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. So here's what he's saying. I'm not going to dishonor you, the king. You sent me to battle, and it's not over. I'm not going to dishonor my comrades who are still out in the field. I'm not going to do this. David said to Uriah, remain here today. I'll send tomorrow. I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that next day, and David invited him, and he ate in the presence and drank, and he made him drunk. So this is intentional. Liquor him up. Thinks he'll go home. But it says... In the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but did not go down to his house. So he doesn't give in in any way. In the morning, so now we're descending. This didn't work. He's trying to cover up the pregnancy. Doesn't work. So here's what he does. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. So just imagine this book is David's letter. Who's carrying the letter? Uriah. Uriah's carrying his death warrant. So in his hand, here's what he has. Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. Pause for a second. If you read 2 Samuel 23, you're going to discover there the names of David's valiant men. There are 37 of them. Would you like to guess who's the last valiant man enlisted? Uriah the Hittite. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, so they leave the walled city. Some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. And Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting, and he instructed the messenger. Now listen to what he tells the messenger to do. When you have finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king, then the king, if the king rises in anger and he says to you, why did you go near the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Je- Je- Rubesheth? Did not a woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? So here's what Joab's anticipating. When you tell this story of how how these men died and how Uriah died, David's probably going to react because he's, he's, a, he's a warrior. He's a tactician. He knows how to fight. He's probably going to get mad at me and he's going to say, why did he send you right to the wall of the city? Doesn't he remember what happened to Abimelech when they threw the, the millstone off and crushed him? So if he does that, if he jumps up and starts criticizing what I did, here's what I want you to say. Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. In other words, here's what Joab's saying. I did exactly what you told me to do, David. I put him at the front. I made sure he died, and he did. So the messenger came, went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. And the messenger said to David, the man gained, the man gained advantage over us and came out against the field, and we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. So they got so close to the wall, the archers could now reach him. So the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead. And your servant, Uriah the Hittite, is dead also. David said to the messenger, he doesn't respond in anger. This is the deceitfulness of sin right here. Watch him. Thus you shall say to Joab, don't let this matter displease you. For the sword devours one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city, overthrow it, and encourage him. In other words, he's doing a good job. And we're back, to, we're back to Bathsheba, who's still being referred to as the wife of Uriah. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. This is not what this woman wanted. Now, the culmination of the story happens. 
The real pivot point, if you're looking in your Bible, is the last verse of verse chapter 11 and the first verse of chapter 12. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The phrase that he had her brought is literally, he sent and collected her. This again is emphasizing the abuse of power that David is willing to exercise. And what God says about this, the New American Standard translates, the thing that David has done was evil in the sight of the Lord. The SV says displeased. So this evil or displeasing thing is in the eyes of the Lord. So David's not treating it like it's evil, but God sees it as evil. Praise God, by his grace, that the story does not end here. And by his grace, regardless of who you are or what you have done, there is hope for you. Because the Lord graciously rebukes David through Nathan. The thing displeased the Lord. See how verse 1 starts in chapter 12? The Lord sent. This thing isn't hinging on David. The Lord God is the center here. The Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had brought. And he brought it up, and it grew with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. See the word? But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he has no pity. Let me just say a few things here before I explain what's going on in this story. If you ever have to concern someone who is in sin, let me just draw off what happens here and other places in the Bible and give you some words of pastoral advice. Don't ever go and confront somebody in anger. Anger will never win someone. Now, if somebody you know and love has sinned against you or their spouse or the church, against God, are you going to be upset with them? But you cannot go in anger. Anger will not accomplish the purpose of God. You cannot go with a haughty spirit. Don't talk about yourself. Using yourself as an example will not help. It will only hurt. You go in a spirit of brokenness, of prayerful brokenness, pleading for repentance before the Lord, before you go, while you are there, and then you speak the truth of God in love. It appears that Nathan tells this story as if it's something that's actually happened. Because that's how David responds to it. He's totally caught up in this. And what David does is both sad and sanctimonious. He doesn't think he's trapped. He's so delusional in his own mind that he responds like he's going to do something about this and this Man deserves to die, and he needs to restore this thing. Here's what I've noticed in my years of being around the church. Not everybody, not everybody, this is not an exclusive statement, but I've noticed that people who get caught up in this downward descent of sin, they either do one of two things. They either run from the church altogether and have nothing to do with Christians, or they become more involved. They get more spiritual in their language. You know why? They're covering themselves up. That's exactly what David does here. Speaks in this sanctimonious way. How dare this man? 
Then Nathan speaks the truth. I think this is one of the bravest sentences in the whole of the Bible. Nathan the prophet is standing before who? The king. If you read the rest of your Bible, prophets and kings have had some rough time. Just ask John the Baptist. And he stands there in this moment when David erupts in anger and he says, as the Lord lives, the man who's done this deserves to die. And Nathan says, you're the man. You're the man. Then he proceeds to deliver the message of God. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord and to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. And therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has put away your sin and you shall not die. Nevertheless, because of this deed, you have utterly scorned the Lord. The child who is born to you shall die. And Nathan went to his house. And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David. And he became sick. Just a couple of things about this interaction. Brothers and sisters, How many times in your life have you become convinced that God's withholding something from you and you need to go get it? You've even played this trick in your mind. You know, I know the Bible addresses that, but that's just legalism. This is holding me back from something that will make me happy. You need to hear what God said to David. If you need it, I'll give it to you. If you don't need it, You don't want it. Don't go get it yourself. Because when you go taking matters into your own hands, you're headed down a pathway you don't want to go. You know what this costs, David? This child is going to die in chapter 12. His son Amnon is going to die at the hands of one of his other children. His son Absalom is going to rise up and try to take his kingdom and end up being killed. And then after David's death, Solomon is going to become threatened by Adonijah and kill him. The consequences of this continue to play out in David's life after this moment. He says, you've done this in secret, this is going to become public. Remember that disheartening moment? When David is walking and the guy's throwing rocks at him. You know why he's throwing rocks at him? Because it's become public what David did. Hear David's confession. I have sinned against the Lord. Not I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. So that begs this question today. Am I progressing into the displeasing deceitfulness of sin? In the 90s, I preached a sermon here called Satan's Amusement Park. Here was my outline. Sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go. Sin will make you stay longer than you ever intended to stay. And last, sin will make you pay a price higher than you ever intended to pay. The slow descent usually begins exciting. It may even heighten a little bit, but as as it continues and you continue to despise the word of the Lord and do what is evil in his sight, 2 Samuel 12, 9, you descend deeper and deeper and deeper. So I have a question. 
particularly those of you who, who may be young and hip and informed or old and hip and informed who've decided what the Bible is just a little bit too constraining. Are you happy? Is indulging your flesh making you happier? It may make you thrilled in the moment, but in the end, are you a happy person? When you're alone by yourself, which I dare say many of you are scared to death to do, are you really happy? There's this double-edged sword. We think, we think at first we're paying this little price to get in with sin. But what we don't realize, the exit door is a huge price. It's bigger than we ever imagined it was going to be. The damage right now that people are doing to each other, particularly as it relates to the things in this text, the damage to human relationships and families is astronomical. What we're talking about here is not simply about our lives being worse. It's sad that the only motivation toward the Christian faith has been that it'll make your life better. Here's what, here's what better become a motivating factor and an understanding. We are despising the Lord. We have done what is evil in His sight. We're living in this false sense of reality that the God of Psalm 51, who receives David's confession, is also the God of Psalm 50, the one whom we will stand before. And the reality is, is that sin displeases Him. And here's what's going to happen today. Some of you are under tremendous conviction because the way you've lived, lived in hidden sin for so long, and what you'd love to do right now is jump up and run out of here. But in a minute, you're thinking, we only got a few more minutes of this thing, and this is going to be over, and everything will go back to normal. No, it won't. You hear me. Your sin will get found out. It will. You cannot cover it forever. And here's what you must come to terms with. That unrepentant sin remains displeasing to the Lord. So it leads me to my second question. Am I responding to the Lord's gracious rebuke by crying for mercy? By God's grace, He has made our sin known through His Word. And He calls us to cry to Him for mercy with repentant hearts. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. How does Nathan respond? The Lord has put away your sin and you shall not die. Now Psalm 51 is a record of more of what David says to God in response to his meeting with Nathan. I'm just going to read the first two verses. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So here's my question then. How has the Lord put away our sin? How does he wash sinners thoroughly from iniquity and cleanse us from our sin? The answer is through the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on the cross. This incredible truth that God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What is it that he did in his death? 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. Christ, who was the sinless Savior, died on the cross and took our sin, all the sin of the world, upon himself and died in our place, taking our place, suffering the wrath of God and the punishment of God. He died. He was buried. In three days he rose again, saying that he is the Lord of all. It is the precious blood of Christ that has ransomed us. You know what that means, brothers and sisters? That doesn't just mean he saved you from sin, that you'll be in heaven forever. It means he's bought you. He's now given a purpose for your life. Romans 7 follows Romans 1 through 6. That's what this book is about. How we deal with this enemy, this ongoing enemy. This indwelling sin that we battle for the rest of our lives. We don't have to go down the path of David, but if we have, what do we need to do? Let me give you four things. 
Four things. Number one, you must confess your sin to God. You must confess your sin to God and repent. I notice a lot of people will confess and stop short of repentance. Repentance means you must turn from it and say, that is not the direction of my heart and life. You must confess your sin and repent. Number two, here's where it's going to get hard. Number two, you must seek restoration. It is restoration, first and foremost, with the Lord. It is with those that you have hurt in the process. Maybe they don't even know you've hurt them. If you've sinned against your spouse, you need to confess it. If you need help doing that, that's what we're here to do. But you need to confess it. You keep covering it up, it's coming out. You say, well, they might leave me. They might. They might. But I'm going to tell you what you do. You you keep hiding it, you'll do it again. This is free. I hadn't said this the rest of the day. My wife and I have an open policy with our electronic devices. We do not respond in anger at any time, and we regularly pick each other's up and sift through it. I've never done anything to question my fidelity to my wife, and she's never done anything to question hers to me, but we keep an open, honest, and straightforward relationship because here's what Jeff Long knows. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love, and he gave me a wife to help keep me in line. Brothers, you need a wife. You need to get a job, get a wife. Confess your sin, you need to seek restoration. Number three is where it really gets hard. You need to prepare for the consequences. We miss this part of 2 Samuel. David had consequences. We live in an age where people just want to end the church. This is how they want to do it. They want to confess their sin. They want to get forgiveness from God. They want forgiveness from the rest of us. And then we're all going to act like it didn't happen. So I'm going to use myself and any pastor or elder in the church. If any of us do what David did, we will no longer be pastors or elders at Parkwood, period. That is a consequence of our sin. We have no business than continuing in this office. You know why? Because we are not above reproach. Confess your sin. Seek restoration. Prepare for the consequences. Number four, walk in the truth. Walk in the truth. Here's the big lie. Here's the big lie. You've worked down through the three, consequences have come, and here's the lie. Here's how, here's how your flesh works. Just give up. Just give up. Just indulge your flesh. Just, just keep doing what you're doing. It's, you've ruined it already. Just... <laughs> My kids will be fine. Wrong. I've dealt with your kids. I've dealt with them as children, as teenagers, and as adults. They won't be fine. Brothers and sisters, we've got to wake up. God has spoken. God has given the means to us, even if we fail, that we seek a pathway of restoration and repentance. That God can restore and work in our life. There are men in this room, in this room and I'm not going to single you out. If you notice, my illustrations have been either about me or very careful because I have been careful not to implicate any of you. But there are men and women in this room who have blown it big, who are still married and walking with Jesus. Praise God. It's not the end of your life. So what does you need to do today? 
You need to confess your sin to God and repent. So let's pray. Oh God, I plead on behalf of men and women who have gathered in this room. Lord, you know every heart. You know that some are not Christians. They're not yet followers of Jesus. And this message has confronted their sin head on and they need to confess their sin and repent and turn to Christ and receive Him as Lord and Savior and be transformed by the power of the Spirit. May they cry out to you for salvation. For those who know you and have given over to their flesh and have walked in the deceitfulness of sin and have come to realize today that they are living a displeasing life before you, Lord, I pray now that they would hear the words of Nathan the prophet. You are the man. You are the woman. May they say these simple words. I have sinned against the Lord. And in the spirit of brokenness and humility, may they hear the response of God. It is washed and cleansed. Oh God, do a work. Do a work in us to bring us to confession, the seeking of restoration. Give us the strength to work through the consequences of what we have done. And by the power of the Spirit, may we walk in the truth, encouraging each other along the way. Oh God, we need your mercy. Thank you that you hear the prayer. Have mercy on me. We pray this in Christ's name.